Unless you've been living under a rock lately, I'm sure you've heard of Stardew Valley. Since its release in 2016, the game has been loved by critics and players alike. At the time of recording, there are almost 96,000 reviews for the game on Steam, and a staggering 97% of them are positive. And the developer concerned Ape is still actively working on the game, adding content, fixing bugs, and bringing it to more and more platforms. One of the best aspects of the game is how everything is interconnected and nothing feels like a waste of time. However, that can make it a little overwhelming trying to figure out what to focus on when you first start the game. So I'm going to give you a little collection of tips and tricks to help you get into the flow of the game, reveal some information that the game isn't very upfront about, and bypass that initial, what the hell am I supposed to be doing feeling. When you first start your game, you'll be greeted by a massively overgrown farm with trees, weeds, rocks, and grass everywhere. For now, don't worry about it too much. You only really need to focus on clearing out a little area by your house. You can clear out the rest of your farm when you need the space or when the debris is getting a little too close to your crops. One viable starting strategy is to go around your farm cutting up all the weeds with your scythe. Note that I'm talking about the weeds that look like little bushes, not grass. Each weed has a chance to give you mixed seeds, which can be planted and will grow into one of several random crops depending on what season it is. The reason these are so nice early on is that they're free. Sure, you won't be able to choose what they become, but at the same time, you can't argue with pure profit. Two things you'll want to be keeping your eye on are the in-game time in the top right and your energy down in the bottom right. If your energy drops down to zero or it gets to 2am, you will pass out, which is kind of annoying. You'll wake up the next day as usual, but you'll get a significant energy penalty, so don't overdo it. Watch the TV every morning. There are a bunch of useful things you can get from it. You can check your daily luck, find out the next day's weather, learn recipes, and even get some additional tips and tricks that are not going to be in this video. Early on in the game, you'll be presented with the main quest, so to speak, which is the community center. You'll also be told you can purchase a membership from Joja, the local supermarket. For your first playthrough, you do not want to be buying the membership because it takes you down a completely separate path to completion and there's no way to undo it. Without giving too much away, the community center will have you experience a large portion of the game while Joja is all about making money. I firmly believe that the community center route is a much better option for a first playthrough than the Joja route. You see these? These are worms. Whenever you come across them in the world, you're going to want to use your hoe on them. Many of the collectibles can only come from these worms and you can also get some useful resources such as clay or even ore. Always hoe the worms. Try to keep a hold of the various items you obtain, even if you don't see an immediate use for them. Chances are you're going to be glad you have them later on. For example, because I'm insane, I felt like crafting and placing a few hundred kegs in my quarry. Well, as it turns out, you needed oak resin for each one, and like an idiot, I'd been selling mine whenever I'd produced one. And since oak resin takes a long time to produce, that made an already tedious project even more tedious. When you start off, you may be tempted to plant as many crops as possible as soon as possible. Well, don't get too eager because you have to water those crops every day, which takes time and, more importantly, energy. I find that a lot of new players, myself included, will at some point make a crop that's a little too big to handle and they'll be stuck for a few days using up all their energy on watering. That means that once they're done, they don't really have any energy to do anything else the rest of the day. Once you hit level 2 farming, you'll be able to craft scarecrows, which makes it so crows can't eat your crops in a pretty large area around the scarecrow. As soon as you can, craft one and plop it down near your crops. As long as you're consistently farming, you'll unlock the ability to craft sprinklers before too long. What they do is they'll keep nearby spaces watered so you don't have to do it yourself. It's really handy and it's a must-have for anyone planning on using most or all of their farmland. I definitely recommend making a few as soon as you can. In general, you'll always want to try to use fertilizer before you plant your crops. You can make basic fertilizer from sap, which is found most commonly by cutting down trees. Fertilizer increases the chances of getting higher quality crops at harvest, so it's always worth doing. If you're planning on raising animals, make sure you build a silo before building a coop or a barn. The silo will let you get hay as you cut the grass on your farm, which will be food for your animals on rainy days and in the winter. Trust me, you want to keep your animals well fed and you don't want to be buying hay. At 50 gold a pop, it can add up pretty quickly. When raising animals, make sure to keep them fed, either by letting them out to eat the grass or keeping hay in their feeders. You'll also want to try to pet them every day. Doing these things will raise your friendship with that animal, which will cause it to produce higher quality products. If you starve your animal, they'll produce really low quality products and they won't produce them that often either. They won't starve to death, but they're not worth having if you don't take care of them. You can actually kill your animals, but only if you repeatedly lock them outside at night. So maybe don't do that. When farming and raising animals, you want to be using the various processing machines that you'll eventually unlock. For example, if you have chickens, you should be putting their eggs into a mayonnaise machine, as mayo sells for a lot more than eggs. You can also put some of your crops into a preserves bin or a keg. This is really worth it since the value of the resulting product is a multiplier added onto the base value of the original product. When you want to upgrade your watering can, make sure to do it on a day where the weather forecast predicts rain the next day. When the TV says rain's coming, water your plants and then head over to the blacksmiths for the upgrade. 
By the time you'll need to water your crops again, your upgrade will be finished. You can also do your upgrading in the winter when there's no crops to water anyway, so you don't lose any growing days. I'm not going to talk too much about maximizing profit in this video, but this one is a little too important not to mention. Try to save up some money for the egg festival on the 13th of spring. This is the only time you can buy strawberry seeds, and they are an amazing crop, especially so early on. Another aspect of the game that can be a little overwhelming is friendship. There are a ton of people in the game, and you can make friends with just about everyone. I'm going to tell you right now, don't focus too hard on making friends with everyone all at once. You spend a lot of time and money trying to make everyone happy, and it'll be pretty stressful trying to get everything done. There's no downside to just taking your time. As you talk to people, give them gifts, and complete special events, you'll gain friendship points, which will fill their hearts in the social tab in your menu. Every day, there's a slight decay of friendship points, but it's a laughably small amount, and you can even prevent it by talking to the person. Once you eventually max out your friendship with someone, that friendship will no longer decay unless you specifically do something to piss them off. Like shooting them with a slingshot. Sorry, Leah. However, the main way to boost friendship is by gifts. You can give each person one gift per day, with a maximum of two gifts per week. The more they like their gift, the more friendship points they get, but be careful not to give them any bad gifts, as you'll actually lose points that way. You can sort of tell how much they like a certain gift by their reactions to it, and there are little clues throughout the game to tell you what some of them love or hate. While each individual's tastes vary, there are some patterns you can find which have been called universals. These are specific items and item categories that most people will feel the same way about. For example, the Prismatic Shard is a universal love. Just about everyone you give it to will love it, except for Haley, who hates it. If you can figure out a few of the universal likes, you can have a good idea of what makes a good gift without having to actually memorize anyone's preferences. Here, I'll give you a little head start. All flowers are a universal like, and all fish are a universal dislike. While we're talking about gifts, there's one really important thing you need to be aware of, and that's birthdays. If you want to be friends with everyone, you definitely want to take advantage of their birthdays, which you can find on the calendar outside of Pierre's shop. Giving someone a gift on their birthday will give you a massive multiplier to the friendship points gain, so it makes the grind a whole lot quicker. And don't worry if you've already given two gifts that week, a birthday gift lets you bypass that limit. If you go over to the Star Drop Saloon on weekends, there will be a lot of people there. This can be a good time to give a bunch of people their gifts all at once. If you see any notices outside the shop, try to get them done as long as they're not too annoying. Not only is there an achievement for doing 40 of them, but each time you complete one, you'll get a nice little friendship boost with whoever posted it. Also, when delivering an item, they'll typically pay three times the normal selling value, so that's always nice. You can marry anyone designated single in the social tab once you've hit 10 hearts with them. If you're looking to get married in your first year, try your best to get them to 10 hearts by the fall, because the next step is pretty annoying to do in the winter. Chances are you'll just have to wait till spring. I know because that's exactly what happened to me. In Pierre's shop, you can buy backpack upgrades. Each one unlocks an additional row of inventory slots, and they cost 2,000 and 10,000 gold respectively. I consider the first one to be a priority purchase, and you should be saving up for it from the start. The second one is really useful, and I definitely advise grabbing it sooner rather than later, but it isn't as mandatory as the first. Whenever you're in the mines, try to bring some food so you can heal yourself. Dying in the mines is one of the most annoying things in the game. You get an energy penalty, you lose a big chunk of money, you'll lose your last few checkpoints in the mine, and worst of all, you'll lose several items. The only thing that's safe are your tools. Yes, you can lose your weapons, and yes, you can lose a big stack of ore. More often than not, dying in the mines is just worth quitting out and restarting the day, so keep some food on you to heal up in case of an emergency. While it doesn't make a huge difference, I find that I prefer upgrading my pickaxe before the other tools. After all, a better pickaxe makes it easier to get more ores, and you're going to need them to upgrade the rest of your tools anyway. I also find that the pickaxe upgrades are the most consistently useful, so you don't feel the diminishing returns as much as some of the other tools. Ore is pretty useless on its own, so you need to smelt it into bars by throwing it and some coal into a furnace. Try to keep all your furnaces in use as much as possible, and be especially sure to load them up before you go to sleep at night so you'll have a fresh batch of bars when you wake up. When fishing, you'll occasionally see these little treasure chests. Hover your bar over it for a bit, and you'll be able to pull up some treasure alongside your catch. Make sure you don't lose the fish in the process, or you won't get the treasure. Treasure chests are one of the best ways to get some of the rarer collectibles in the game, so it's worth pursuing. The fish that spawn are influenced not only by where you're fishing, but also the season, time of day, and weather. If you're hunting for a certain fish that you don't know only spawns in the rain, you could very easily spend days fishing in sunny weather, which will just waste your time. So be aware of that when planning out your fishing trips. If you're playing on the PC, consider checking out some of the mods available. There's a massive collection over on Nexus Mods, and due to a player-made program known as Smappy, installing mods is really, really easy. I'd recommend playing through at least a full in-game year before trying any of the major gameplay-altering mods, but there's still plenty of things available for old and new players alike. And lastly, but most importantly, have fun and don't get stressed out trying to get everything done. Stardew Valley is meant to be an enjoyable, relaxing experience, and there's no time limit to do anything. 
You could literally sleep for 100 in-game years and not have any real consequences, so have fun with it and don't feel like you have to be at maximum efficiency at all times. Thanks for watching. If you have any nitpicks or suggestions for this video, I'd love to hear about it in the comments section down below. This video was basically a test run for other newbie guides I'm going to make for games with higher skill caps, so I want to make them the best I can. But once again, thank you all for watching, and I'll see you next time. Can you make my world go